Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Big Food Workshop hosted by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, a three-day feast of inspiring speaker sessions designed to help you, our audience, all around the world to gain the insights and inspiration you need to play your part in shaping a truly resilient food system as we work to build back better. Now, if you missed our opening session earlier today, which took place just a couple hours ago, it's already up on the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's YouTube channel, so do check it out. And later on, we'll pull up a QR code that can lead us to our website, um, where you can see all sorts of videos as we move through these three days of activities. Now, as a reminder, we invite you, no matter what channel you're tuning in from today, to engage with us. Go ahead and use the comments, introduce yourselves, who you are, where you are in the world, what organization you're with, perhaps, and do share your comments, questions, all the way through this session. It will be interactive, and we want to make this as engaging as possible as we come together in our truly global virtual community today. Now, during this session, we're serving up our first course, which is called The City, Sparking Food System Transformation. Now, to investigate this food city dynamic, I'm joined by two incredible thought leaders on this topic, Carolyn Steele and Harriet Friedman. Carolyn is the author of Hungry City, How Food Shapes Our Lives, and most recently launched Setopia, How Food Can Save the World. She's also the director of Kilburn Nightingale Architects in London and you'll get the chance to meet her in a moment. And Harriet, Harriet is Professor Emerita of Sociology at the University of Toronto, my hometown, so it's great to have her joining us today. And she's played an integral role in shaping Toronto's food policy. She's also published numerous pieces on cities and food system transformation, looking across social and natural scales. It is such a privilege to have both of you joining us live today, and I'd like to just give each of you a chance in a minute or so to introduce yourselves and your work and perspective, and then we'll start digging into our discussion, which I know will be very lively and rich. Um, so let's begin with you, Harriet, across the Atlantic today. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, thank you for inviting me for this, and it's a privilege to uh, engage with Carolyn in particular. Um, yes, I'm a, I have had a double life as an intellectual working on food systems across disciplines and across very long periods of time, really focusing on since the colonial era, so 500 years ago. And um, I've shifted from the political economy there to political ecology and looking very much more at the natural foundations, including humans as part of nature, of uh, the way that um, the world was transformed around cities and agriculture uh, and other resources, mining. The other part of my double life has been in the Toronto Food Policy Council which I've been involved with since even before the beginning, some of the earlier um, things. And I watched your um, first session this morning and I was reminded very strongly of how influenced we were when we formed the Food Policy Council here in the early 1990s by the London Food Commission, as it was then, it's become the London Food Board over many transmutations. Um, and uh, what was crucial and has remained crucial about the Toronto Food Policy Council is its location in city government and public health in particular. Wonderful, thank you. We're so happy to have you. Um, Carolyn, give us a little introduction of yourself. Thank you very much indeed. And it's also a great pleasure and honor to be here alongside Harriet. Um, and just very briefly, I'm an architect by training. I uh, studied at Cambridge, taught at Cambridge for many years and the London School of Economics. Um, but then I had this kind of light bulb moment, uh, I guess, kind of in April, well, I know actually, <laughs> in April 2000. Um, and that light bulb moment was the idea of what it would be to describe a city through food. Um, and that very quickly became the question of what it takes to feed a city. Um, and I wrote the book that you kindly mentioned, Hungry City, which came out in 2008. And I guess it came out, you know, at a time when there was growing awareness of the fact that we hadn't, as it were, solved the food problem. Um, and indeed, it was, of course, the year of the financial crash and also the year that, you know, many, many countries saw food riots and so on. Um, and out of that book, I kind of developed this idea that really food shapes our lives in many ways that we both do and do not see. Um, 
and I invented a word for that, which which is Zootopia, which is now, as you kindly said in your introduction, the title of my second book. Uh, and that just comes from the Greek word sitos for food and topos for place. Um, and the basic premise is that we live in a world that's shaped by food, um, but we don't really see many of its effects. But actually, food shapes so many aspects of our lives that we can use it as a wonderful connective tool to uh, think about the problems that we face in a kind of in a connected way and also to affect real change. So it's it's really become my kind of lens through which I see the world, I guess. Amazing. Excellent. Thank you both. All right. Well, let's dive right in. And I want to pick right back up with you, Carolyn, on Zootopia. And perhaps as we're diving in, actually first zooming out and looking at the economy. I mean, this whole workshop is about food, but we at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation our mission is to accelerate the global economy to a circular one. And therefore, we know we need to work on food. It's so fundamental. And in Zootopia, you are investigating food, you're looking at the economy, and you are understanding the how you can't speak about the economy without speaking about food, and vice versa, is also mm. true. And you mention a particular Greek word that I want you to elaborate on. Um, Oikonomia, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly or <laughs> close well, enough. <laughs> to ask, so let's just assume you are. <laughs> but I'd love for you, for our audience's value, just to explain what that word is and how, how you contextualize it. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Well, oikonomia, which of course, you know, however you pronounce it, is in fact the word that gave us our modern word economics, um, is a really interesting concept. Both Plato and Aristotle talk about this a lot. And it really is about the relationship between the city and the productive hinterland that supplies it with food and other resources. And both Plato and Aristotle actually talk about the need for the city to remain small because basically the bigger it gets, the further and further away it gets from its you know, sources of sustenance. Um, it's a kind of geometrical problem, if you like. So for both of them, the ideal was a kind of what I call the fried egg, uh, um, you know, pr approach to urbanity, which is that uh, the city is a kind of like the yoke in the middle and the white is the countryside around. Now, the word oikonomia actually means household management. So it's from oikos, which is the Greek for house, and nomos, which is the Greek for management, as you would assume, and of what I've just said. And, and basically the ideal for them was that every citizen would have a house in the city and a farm in the countryside and the farm would feed the house. So oikos nomos or oikonomia is, is basically the fact that every household is self-sufficient because it has a little patch of land that feeds it. And then you multiply that up many times and then the city itself becomes self-sufficient because everybody has a little farm on the outside. Um, and this for both Plato and Aristotle was the ideal of the city. So once there were enough people in the city that it could sort of, you know, have the division of labor necessary to kind of, you know, mend shoes and kind of build furniture and so on, then it should grow no bigger because, you know, if it remains small, then it would be possible for it to become self-sufficient, which they both saw as the sort of the key to its political autonomy. Um, and I mean, very interestingly, Aristotle warned against another Greek word, krematistike, which interestingly we have not adopted as the root of one of our modern words. I wonder why that could be. Um, but essentially that is the making of money for its own sake. Um, and I think it's deeply ironic that as, actually that's pretty much what our modern economics actually do. But Aristotle said there was no point in this because there was never a, a point at which you reached a balance because there's never a point at which you have enough money. Whereas if your aim is to reach a balance between city and country, then there is a point at which that can be, can be reached. So I think it's a super, super interesting concept for our time in showing us everything that's wrong with our economics. And if I could just say one thing really quickly as well on this very important point, food is the most valuable thing in our lives. Um, you know, we, we have to have food every day, otherwise we die. So food really is life. And the fact that we've predicated our economics and indeed politics on the existence of something called cheap food, which cannot and does not exist, and we've created the illusion of it by externalizing its true costs, is, in my view, the problem. So what I call Zootopian economics is the idea that we re-embed the value in food and base our new economy around it. Thank you. There's, there's so much in there to dig into and, and just drawing some parallels to our work and, and some of the findings in our report that we published last year and this dynamic between 
urban and peri-urban production. And actually about 40% of the world's existing irrigated cropland is in that 20 kilometer donut around cities. And now in this pandemic where cities are really starting to wake up and some of the fragility is being exposed, we're looking at how to really redesign these systems to get these balances kind of back in, in, in line with what you were just describing centuries ago. Um, and Harriet, I want to pick up on a specific phrase that relates to this, and you use quite often in your writing around cities as metabolizers and this phrase of urban metabolism. Can you just discuss, share your views on that, and perhaps how we can reimagine this role that cities can play, moving from endpoints driving a highly linear damaging system to actually catalysts, you know, positively shaping the countryside and that getting that city countryside dynamic right? Yeah, thanks. Uh, great question. Uh, metabolism is, um, it's a metaphor from that sees the city as an organism. And I like that because most of our thinking has been uh, using mechanical metaphors, not just for cities, but for almost everything, you know, action, reaction. And I think we're trying to move toward more organic metaphors for everything. So that's what I'm doing here. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm reinterpreting the uh, way that uh, cities got from what Aristotle described or Carolyn described uh, to linear systems, very far reaching systems. And I think we have to reinterpret the colonial history as a city, as a city commodity frontier history, that that's trying to come forward, not just for me, but from a number of people now, that London was the center of the emergent British Empire, and London emerged as a global city um, from its ancient roots uh, by financing the sugar trade, by financing the slave trade to make it happen, and that these completely simplified by complex biocultural landscapes in Africa in where this, uh, many young people were taken out, um, where maize was brought in as a new subsistence food, and in the Caribbean where indigenous people were completely um, decimated, the forested landscape was completely transformed and three uh, alien, <laughs> well introduced, because I, I don't believe that um, we wanna get back to something falsely called native all the time, but that the three things that were introduced were the colonial landowners, in this case, British, but also French or Dutch, um, African laborers enslaved, and sugar, which is an agent, Asian plant. And all of this created a simplified and completely different ecosystem that was the beginning, a biocultural landscape, that was the beginning of something uh, that was to proceed through phases until now. At the same time, urbanization, I, those Asian words suggest that there's something inevitable about it. And there's nothing inevitable about it. That, this, that the city of London and then later cities grew up in relation to these very long distance supply of materials and energy into the city, that is to the metabolism of the city and completely transform their own countrysides from suppliers of the city to um, other places, you know, to, to places that became specialized in various ways, marginal in various ways, uh, so that this, the growth of cities and the growth of not global exactly, but translocal supply chains has been a, a different way to think about the history uh, that we've lived for 500 years. So understanding how it all became linear, I think, is crucial to bringing it back. And just to add one more, I think, crucial point here is that even when the peri-urban area is a, a huge part of the food supply of the world uh, from city to city, it doesn't necessarily supply that city. So since the 1990s with the supermarkets uh, taking over long distance supply chains, the peri-urban area, very fertile around Toronto, that produced all of our fruits and vegetables got converted pretty quickly to uh, producers of monocultural carrots and onions for export while the, 
the supermarkets were bringing in carrots and onions um, from wherever it worked for them to source it. So we have to, and we've started re, reshifting that, you know, we started little bits of this emergent reconnecting of the city and the countryside here, but that's what we have to work with. Yeah, and that rewiring the logic is something that really resonates with me because since we started this food work, even before we started the food initiative and we were doing analysis, we were looking at four cities, including Guelph in Canada, actually, so not Toronto, but not too far away, um, and just understanding what the food flows are. And that's often a big gap when it comes to data. But then if you are able to find that data, you often find that there's a lack of logic in those balances and where the food's actually flowing in and out. Um, so it's super critical and I think underpinning a lot of that redesign for resilience that we're seeing the need for, especially urgently now. If I could add just one more thing. One of the things about looking at this world ecologically is that we bring in the material flows where most of the data are collected and most of the logic is defined by the value of money flows. And as Carolyn said, much of those flows are actually externalized costs. So, you know, we lose lots in that. Yeah. Yeah, no, Carolyn, I want to jump back over to you and dig into something else that came through in Zootopia, especially, and, and this phrase which Aristotle used, calling us political animals. And you reference that phrase quite a bit in your work, which I want to hear more of, and, and also this idea of the urban paradox. What is the urban mm. paradox? Yes, I'm, I'm not totally obsessed with Aristotle, by the way, but he uh, he does turn out to be an incredibly interesting thinker when it comes to food and, and what a good life is. So I use his phrase political animals, uh, which is a famous phrase that he uses to describe humans. And what I find really interesting about it is that it describes a kind of inherent duality in us. So we're political, which means that we're social, which means that we need to gather together in groups in order to be more than the sum of our parts. But we're also animals, which means that we need the natural world. Um, and we belong in both places, but they're not the same place. If you think about, and this is what I call the urban paradox, you know, the fact that we talk about ourselves as urban, you know, and oh, you know, 60% of people are going to be living in cities by blah, blah year and so on. Well, yeah, that may be true physically, but actually, again, to go back to Harriet's point, you know, if you're an animal and you need resources that come from the natural world, then you're not really in a profound sense living in the city you're actually living in nature and then the city is like a sort of a a, a local manifest you know a interpretation of a, of a place to live but it's actually not what's sustaining you so that is the paradox is that as political animals we need the city and we need the countryside but in a sense we've forgotten this you know we've forgotten to create this balance um and, you know, I mean, I, I look at amazing images if, if, you know, anyone watching knows the incredible Lawrence Setti image of the allegory of effects of good government, which is a, a big fresco in the city of Siena, you know, where on the one hand you have the city and on the other you have nature and they're completely balanced. You know, and I think this is an idea that we've forgotten that the allegory of good government, and I say that advisedly because politicians, it seems to me, have fallen off a cliff when it comes to taking any responsibility for feeding people, but um, not least during the pandemic, by the way, that's a whole other story. But, um, you know, this really, the ideal, if you ask the question of what is the ideal landscape for human flourishing um, or for political animals, it really is to have one foot in the country and one foot in the city, you know, which is what, interestingly, through history, rich people have always had. They've always had the place in town and the place in the country. But of course, most of us can't afford even one house, let alone two. So then the question is, how do you design the world so that, and this is my formulation, I, I call it maximizing the urban rural interface, which is basically finding ways at any scale. So this could be growing herbs on your kitchen roof, you know, the kitchen sort of windowsill, or it could be on a roof or, you know, it could be community gardens in a housing estate, or it could be to do with very critically the city's relationship with its local region and strengthening that relationship. But in any case, the way we design cities and the way we design, as it were, countryside, because we design both, and that's also something we tend to forget. Um, I think if we do it with the idea of maximizing the interface in mind, you know, so the fried egg model I spoke about earlier is one way of doing that, but clearly 
cities don't look like fried eggs these days. So you can also post fit productive landscape into the city. This is another way of doing it. But however you do it, I think, you know, the, to rebalance, to recalibrate the relationship between urban and rural is, is what I'm really talking about. And um, it seems to me that if we're going to go forward into a kind of a good low or zero carbon life in, you know, towards mid-century, then people having access to both the city and the country is really critical. And of course, the internet can help us with this because as we're discovering during the lockdown of COVID, people are actually discovering they don't have to be physically in a city in order to be connected. So I think there's huge latent potential here to rethink, you know, the rural economy and the urban economy uh, in the light of this idea that, you know, if we have access to people and to nature, we don't need much else. And neither of those things have to destroy the planet. Thank you. Harriet, do you, do you have any thoughts that you wanted to share on this question too? Um, it was so well said, Carolyn. Uh, remind me what the question is. <laughs> well, you're free to pick up on anything that Carolyn just mentioned, because it was really looking at the, the urban paradox, but then what we just moved into of that interface between urban, rural, and, and I think what was really highlighted for me mm -hmm. was the importance of design and spatial design, which we often overlook when it comes to urban food systems. Absolutely. And I would add to that um, something I know Carolyn has a lot to say about as well, which is the crucial role of land, that uh, land reform, land management, that what's happened in the countries I know about has been that urban planning and whatever passes as rural planning, it's mainly agricultural planning, separating everything else out of the countryside besides agriculture and then letting that get ever more simple. But those two things have happened in parallel without a conversation with each other. So many cities, especially in North America, have paved over the very fertile land that caused them to be sited there in the first place. And the land that's left, as I said, like the Holland Marsh near Toronto, then gets reintegrated into these long distance supply chains that are about money rather than connecting the urban and rural, or in fact, they disconnect what was connected before. So we tend to pave it over with urban sprawl. Uh, that uh, area was the one that was richest in the nutrient food, the nutrient rich foods, the fruits and vegetables and the you know, cheese makers and all those things that were near the city, they get pushed farther out. And what's happened in recent decades has been that those things that were available, for instance, during the depression, there were bread lines, but no apple lines, right? Apples were available to everybody. Whereas now fresh fruits and vegetables are extremely expensive because they have to come from very far away. Um, and the local farmland has, either, has been some combination of altered uh, so that it's non-food producing or it has been turned into simplified monocultures centered around a very small handful of crops and a very genetically uh, simplified uh, set of varieties of those crops and animals. So a lot of it is for livestock. The entire countryside of Ontario, which is in so rich uh, in, in fertility, has become poor for farmers by producing corn and soybeans. And those are mostly destined to feed animals which are very far away. And all of this has become clear in the COVID crisis. Um, you know, all these complicated, what uh, Cronin, I think taking from Aristotle calls second nature. When we disrupt the natural connections, which are also social, then we have to replace them with complex financial mechanisms and monetary mechanisms and so on. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks so much, Harriet and Carolyn. Now we'll switch over to Q&A from the audience in just a minute. So I just want to remind everyone tuning in online to continue to add your questions on whatever channel you're on, and we'll try and pick them up in our open Q&A in a, in a couple moments. Um, but I do want to hear a couple further thoughts from both of you. Again, going back to Setopia, there's a part where 
Carolyn Yur, and I found it very ironic because it was just at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis starting to unfold that I was reading this passage, reflecting on the 2008 economic crisis yeah. and this missed opportunity. And as we're mm -hmm. still sitting in this swirl of uncertainty, of navigating the pandemic, especially for cities around the world, what are things that you're seeing that, I mean, what are your biggest hopes? That's what I'd like to hear is what mm -hmm. is your biggest hope of what does change? coming out of this? Because there's a clear need and opportunity for rewiring, redesigning this urban rural dynamic to make yes, systems that work. Yeah, I mean, I, I think also to, you know, to pick up on something Harriet just mentioned, you know, I think the sort of, we, we pre, prior to COVID, we, th there was this kind of idea that we were pursuing that was all about, you know, kind of grabbing stuff from wherever it came from, you know, massive consumerism, running 800 miles an hour, to have a good life, quote unquote, so you could afford a good life. And it was just frenetic. It was not in time and it was not in place. And, you know, I mean, I know which page you're referring to. It's page 162, because everybody who reads Utopia refers to it, because it's the one in which I say it's quite interesting that major social change and actually our best natures tend to be, reveal themselves in a crisis. So, for example, you know, the UK welfare state came out of the Second World War uh, and the New Deal in America came out of the, the Great Depression. So I think we are now living through a period of really, really critical few months, just a few months when the opportunity to question whether this crazy trajectory we were on was actually a good idea or not is, is possible. And, you know, I think some of the things that people have noticed under lockdown is that, you know, actually spending time with your kids, kind of, you know, cooking from scratch, um, you know, growing your own food, connecting with local producers. Again, as Harriet said, during lockdown, lots of local food producers have frantically had to find new markets. And there's been all these amazing new connections between local producers and, and consumers. And, you know, I think all of those things together are things that I was already arguing for in the book, need to be part of this new vision of a good life that is not predicated on, dashing around and, and kind of earning so much money that you can always buy a new car every year in this crazy consumerism, but actually about finding the joy and the pleasure in what I call living in time. And of course, you know, food is all about that. You know, it's seasonal, if you let it be. Um, it's local, it's about a terroir. It's a, sorry to use a French word where an English one would probably have been fine, but you know, sort of a, a locality, an actual place, you know, and historically as humans, we found our home and we found our sense of belonging in a particular place that fed us. And again, as Harriet said, this connection has been lost because cities were always founded in fertile areas for a very, very blindingly obvious reason. And then when they expand, they, they expand over the best farmland, you know, it's just insane that we do this. So um, I think there's a lot of latent fertility in existing cities, actually, because they tend to expand in the form of suburbs. So actually, everyone's got a back garden that has a lot of latent fertility in it. But also this idea that, you know, we can we can make home again um, and be happy being producers as well as consumers um, is a really critical idea. You know, and it goes into the whole conversation about what good work in the 21st century looks like. And I think you know, the fact that we can still make stuff, we can still mend our clothes, we can still build furniture, and critically, we can grow, cook, and share our food is, is a huge takeaway that I really, really hope that we take out of lockdown and say this should and could be built into a new economy and a new vision of, of a good life going forward. Yeah, that real, that real shift in values and our whole idea of what we're working towards. Yeah. Definitely resonates. And Harriet, would love to hear from you. What, what is a big hope that you have in terms of what might change? There's been a huge burst of creativity in trying to fill in when the restaurants close, where will the farmers send their food? And, and people have virtual farmers markets. They have, there, there are many, many things in the Toronto area and I read about them or hear about them in other places as well. And so the question is, can we build on that creativity? And I think that the way to build on it will be first of all, to support the small businesses which are in such serious danger now, the restaurants, food shops and so on. Uh, but most of all, to reconnect in the territorial frame so that we have a networked territorially embedded food system that's not, it can include trade, certainly, 
but where the foundations are a reconstruction of the networks between city and countryside, just as, as Carolyn says. And it's, we can build on models like energy for distributed systems instead of centralized systems. And my favorite example right now is uh, comes from Quebec, which is hardly typical in Canada, but it's spreading across Canada. Um, it's um, a, an organization called um, Table de Chef, which is a chef's table, uh, which started to recover food waste and to educate young people, especially in schools, about growing and cooking food. But when the COVID crisis came and big hotels were closed and stadiums and uh, all the public institutions that had uh, served meals, the chefs got together uh, through the table de chef and they started producing massive quantities of food, of good food, you know, I mean, um, quality food. And they now distribute uh, 2 million meals inside Quebec City and Montreal. And I don't know how much of, of the rest of the province. And they're also spreading now to, when, and it's scaling out. So with a distributed system, you don't scale up, you scale out. You scale up in place, but you, uh, try to um, be a model or follow the models from other places. So Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, and so on. We're now adopting this and it's called um, Cuisine Solidaire there. So it's Solidarity Kitchens in English. And they are uh, using these abandoned or, you know, could be abandoned, uh, like fancy hotel kitchens uh, to produce delicious and healthy meals for very large numbers of hungry people who of course grown. Now, can we build on that? Or will we go back to something, you know, that's more like uh, what was there before? I think it's very much in question. Mm, yeah, I think just harnessing our innate creativity, which really is starting to shine. And, and we are seeing that people can come up with, individual small groups can come up with new creative solutions, especially harnessing um, digital capabilities that are these tools available to us and we didn't have even a decade, a couple decades ago. Um, I, I hope too that that is fully harnessed and that we're able to maximize that. Um, Harry, I'm, I'm going to plug a question that we received through YouTube from one of the viewers, which relates right back to the creating territorial systems now and you also mentioned this need in the food system right it's, it's not you might have moments of scale but there's so much in the replicability right when it comes to scaling out and these distributed systems so do you have any concrete examples or suggestions of what politicians what solutions can be put in place to create these territorial systems that's one of the questions that we've received from a viewer uh, yes, certainly. Uh, the first thing I think we need to do is uh, redesign all our regulations about agricultural and rural land. Um, that includes ownership and it includes use. And I'll just give one example in Canada, which I think is pretty common, which is that in the 19, all our regulations are pretty well past their best before date. Uh, and in after World War II, the way to protect farmland, instead of saying land has to be farmed, they said, well, we, we know that if farmland is broken up, it'll be divided for shopping malls and suburban developments. So what we'll do is prevent it from being divided up. Now, of course, what you need for production near the cities, especially vegetables, goats, you know, whatever it's going to be, is you need small pieces of land. And it is extremely difficult now, I could get into many more details, of course, but it's extremely difficult now to actually grow, to actually have young people, especially in groups, which is what they want to do to be social often, to actually be able to get access to this land and be able to farm it and supply it to the cities. The, at the same time, the corn and soybean producers are struggling. They're struggling economically, they're struggling with debt. Um, and that was before COVID. So then with COVID, of course, it's it quite exacerbated. So we really need to reorganize our way of uh, protecting land and 
have it and designing the uses of that land and the people who can best do it. So they're young farmers who can't get access. They're old farmers whose kids have become electric, electrical engineers and you know, computer scientists. <laughs> Excellent. Um, we have one minute, we're in our final minute and I just wanna see, Carolyn, did you have any final thoughts that you wanted to share before we switch gears and I pass over to Nick for the second half of the session? Well, I mean, I think the two words in a way that has sort of popped out at me in our conversation so far that is absolutely critical is value and land. And, you know, and to go back to what I said, and Harriet's mentioned it just now, you can't farm without access to land and you can't flourish without access to land. And by treating food as cheap, which doesn't exist, we've actually lost the connection in our entire economic system and our total value system even more critically between what really matters, which is basically territory, you know, nature, I mean, call it what you like, our relationship with the planet. So we have to have a new economics and food is just a brilliant, brilliant way of doing it because it encapsulates everything, both our social relationships and our relationships to nature are all powerfully channeled through food. So by valuing food, we put value back in the land and we also put value back in our entire way of thinking. So I think those are two critical things I'd pull out. Thank you. Such a wonderful sentiment to wrap up our very rich discussion. I know we could have gone on for hours, but truly do appreciate you tuning in and spending this time sharing so many great insights um, with our audience all around the world. So thank you both. Um, now, in a brief moment, you are going to see on your screen a short video which will come up with a QR code. Um, do take out your phone and feel free to scan that, which will take you to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's website dedicated to this workshop, and you can keep updated to all the highlights there. Um, but I'm going to say goodbye to all of you, at least for this session, and Nick Jeffries, my colleague from our team, will be taking the show forward, um, speaking to someone who is moving from theory, which we just discussed, and actually putting it on the ground in East Africa. So more from Nick and his guest speaker in a moment. Thank you. Hello, welcome back to the Big Food Workshop. My name is Nick Jeffries, and what a really rich exchange that was. Some real food for thought. Isn't it incredible how a tiny virus has unleashed such a flurry of creativity, but also uh, made us rethink what reconstitutes a, a good life. Caroline's book, Hungry City, was one of my absolute favorite books uh, during our analytical period. Uh, as a historical overview of how uh, cities have been fed, I don't think you can beat it. And I can't wait to read her latest book. So moving from history and theory to practical on the ground of, of, of food system thinking, we have on the line Stephen Otieno, African Regional Food Coordinator for C40, which is a network of about 100 cities around the world with a primary focus on tackling climate change. Stephen, thanks for joining us at the Big Food Workshop. So for the last few years, Stephen has been engaged in developing a, uh, a food strategy for the city of Nairobi. That's gonna be the topic of this next session. Uh, but if people, on interest, if people in our audience are interested in this uh, region or how C40 addresses climate change through their focus on urban food systems, uh, then please feel free to share your questions and we'll try our hardest to direct a few of those questions to Stephen in the second half of this session. But to kick, th kick things off, Stephen, for those in our audience who are unfamiliar uh, with the geography where you work, can you paint a picture of food and agriculture in Nairobi and the surrounding area? Thank you, thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you so much for having me uh, in this wonderful uh, workshop. But also just a big uh, grateful to have listened to the other great presenter, Harriet and uh, Carol. And uh, it's actually a pleasure for us now to move and discuss uh, about this uh, critical issue about food systems right now. Uh, I'm based in Nairobi in Kenya, which is in East Africa right now, but uh, my role currently, I oversee 
uh, some of our uh, African countries uh, in terms of helping them address sustainable food system strategy. So basically for the last two years, I was uh, working in partnership with the FAO and uh, the city of Nairobi to help them develop a food system strategy. But just to give you a bit of some context when it comes to Nairobi, then realize that Nairobi has about a population of about 4.4 million people. And uh, that's not considering that there are 6 million people who are using the city or within the city during the daytime. So the daytime population is actually quite high. And as urbanization trends continue, we have a rapid urbanization uh, rate of about 4% and a population growth rate of also another 3%. So this pro pro uh, population trajectory just uh, seems uh, is projected to grow. And if you look at it from the context of the African system, then we know that 60% of the consumer base of the, is based in the African, uh, is African food economy right now. 60% of them live in urban, uh, urban areas. And this is just projected to grow. And as cities have been viewed very much as consumption hubs, just as Harriet has alluded to, we need that to change that view to look at them as uh, living organisms. And just to define the, seat, the, food, the food system situation in Nairobi, I'll just call it, possibly I'll call it highly complex and uh, just fused with about formal and informal networks. There are multiple layers and interests. And uh, of course, some um, interests are clear, but others you just need to require, you need some sort of uh, deep analysis for you to understand. And in terms of access to food, for example, you'll find that uh, about, between one to 20% of the food that is consumed within the city actually is produced within the city. It just depends on which kind of food is produced. So that tells you that the city is highly reliant on external sources. So about 80% of the food that is consumed within the city comes from other places. So they might be regional or they might come outside from outside the country. So in, in, in terms of looking at it from its totality, this is actually projected in even other East African cities, for example. I was part uh, of a research team in 2014 and 15 when we did the mapping of the food flows within the East African region. And some of those analyses, you can actually start to see the segments of the different population and how people access food, for example. So you'll find that most of this wholesale, that this segment of population that access their food from the wholesale food markets, is are run by the cities and they receive, of course, food in, the, in, in wholesale and then most of which is locally, sourced, but again, within the region. You have the informal markets, for example, which are mostly run by women traders. And these uh, are not in terms of, in, uh, they're not illegal, but they're just informal because they, they do not have the structural infrastructure sort of to, to, trade, uh, to trade, but they pay taxes and levies and so on. Then you, of course, you have another segment of the population that accesses their food from supermarkets and with urbanization and, uh, a bit of more affluence, then you find that they are able to source their food from the markets, uh, from the supermarkets. And then you have, you have this niche uh, population segment of the population that are getting their food uh, from, let's say, farmers markets specializing in organic food and so on. Uh, we have highly specialized food stores and so on. But again, there's also a small minority of, of producers who actually produce for their own consumption. So basically, if you look at that uh, food flow mapping, you can be able to understand that uh, food is more for, uh, is segmented actually, or and uh, based on how uh, on your social status, for example, on how much you can how, how what can you afford. That that's how you can access your food. So basically, that reverberates around the the, the region, or across across the region, but also uh, across the continent. It's a it's a very clear clear picture. Okay. So it's quite a complex situation, but there's more of an informal sector than you would get, say, in London or New York. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And so for the last two years, you've been developing this food strategy, and this food strategy has been based on this sort of food system approach, which you've sort of hinted at before, the sort of connectivity with other systems in the city. So can you just unpack this concept of a food system approach a little more and how this kind of thing could, could benefit Nairobi and the surrounding area? Yeah. Uh uh, just also just to emphasize uh, the, the, the city of Nairobi has been developing this food system strategy for quite some time and uh, it's not yet a complete document so there's still some work to be done and there's also a lot of public participation that is currently going on and I guess now with the COVID crisis I'm sure much more work is going to be done. 
But just critically looking at it, is, I think the food system approach is more of an interdisciplinary framework that uh, is very useful in terms of shaping research or advancing policy. And I think this is where cities, if you look at cities, are those, those cities that have developed the sustainable food system strategies, they have, all, they have always leveraged on uh, relationships between the different parts of the food system. And also on the other side, they look at the outcomes of those systems. So social ecological, uh, socioeconomic outcomes, for example, and also if you look at the environment uh, aspect of it, so in the climate terms. But in principle, we have about, okay, if, if I may break it in about four key elements. So in terms of the process, for example, in the food system, so the processes like, are we looking from, from the growing, the, uh, the harvesting, the distribution, the, uh, the consumption and so on, packaging, transportation, all those, just the process. Then there's a second layer of that that we also have to look at. These are the inputs that are used, and again, the outputs that are generated from this uh, input. So from these processes, for example. So that, that's the second layer that also we need to look at uh, when we are looking at this food system approach. And of course, the third part is the most important part, which is the actors, of course. So these are actors who are these producers because there are people behind this, uh, these processes. So they are the producers, we have the transporters, we have the consumers, and, and, and so many other uh, uh, players. But I, uh, and again, now to, to sort of sum, sum it up now, we have the food environment. So that food environment sort of encapsulates all these uh, different components of the food system. And of course, the result of one which is very inefficient then becomes that the food environment in cities, as we can describe it, as a, we can describe it as a bit uh, disjointed, for example. So we can call it disjointed. And for us now to move forward in terms of uh, harmonizing, and we have to agree, of course, on some basic principles on how do we address, uh, how do we start looking at food systems from a, a systems approach exactly, as food from a systems approach. And I think every city needs to look at what are the main challenges and what are the barriers, what are the opportunities that present themselves. For Nairobi, for example, uh, I think the issue of access in terms of people having adequate food, uh, food in adequate quantities, uh, accessibility and looking at things like diversity in the diet, looking at the quality of the food that people are actually consuming and so on. Those are some of the issues that we need to look at. And I think eventually we need to get to a point where we, we agree that we need to provide the citizens with the best opportunity for a food, a nutritious, uh, uh, nutritious food, for example. And these also have to be produced in a safe environmental uh, space so that at least we do not uh, feed people with, uh, without looking at those production systems. And again, uh, it, it's very important because if you look at the production systems that most of our cities rely on, as I've mentioned that Nairobi does not, it relies a lot on food that comes from outside. If you look at some of the climate uh, uh, issues that are currently taking place right now, we have a locust invasion, yeah. we have floods taking place, we have droughts in, all over. And these are, these, are, these are some of the things that are now becoming more intense and they're happening at a, at a, they're becoming more intense, of course, and they are happen, happening more frequently. So as a city, Nairobi can no longer just sit and wait. They have to start beginning some of these uh, discussions. They have to have these discussions up. How are we going to strengthen, for example, our uh, urban rural linkages? You know, how, because these are very important in terms of creating those sort of dynamic intersections between the cities and peri urban areas. And that's, that's the, some of the discussion that we need to have. And, uh, and, I, and in my view, I think that sort of uh, food system approach yeah. sort of helps, to, it, it just sort of offers a strategic entry point for cities to intervene, to start enacting change, and just to make sure that we have. Uh, cities leapfrogging into a healthy, nutritious, sustainable food future. And we have to make sure that we dedicate efforts towards this course, of course. Okay, so it's about connecting the dots. Historically, it's been a little bit disjointed uh, in, the, in the sort of approach of uh, city officials to, to food systems. And, and, and as you hinted at yesterday, Nicole, the, co the COVID crisis and the recovery seems to have elevated food system thinking up the sort of priority list in Nairobi. Can you tell us a little bit about what... Um, you are seeing in Nairobi right now, as, as um, the city officials are looking forward to the, to the, you know, to the next few months and, and, and years of the COVID recovery? Yeah, I, I think uh, part of our work with uh, working with the city, I think, uh, has showed us that in general, the concept of the food system is a, is, is a bit of a new concept. 
So they are, and it's, 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 it's a new concept for many city officials. And again, for also most of the city residents alike. So it's not something that, that, that they understand. And I think moving forward, I think this is, uh, if, no, moving backwards, I think if we start looking at it from a sort of a, it's a structural challenge. So look at it historically, you'll find that our cities and institutions of governance, they were sort of designed in a way in which people would operate in silos. So you'll find that a, a city official who's working in markets will not talk to a city official who's working in public health and will not talk to a city official who's working in, 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 in uh, finance, for example. And then you just find that even these cities now, these departments or these city officials, now they start comp competing for funding within the city. And it just, I think COVID has just sort of compounded those underlying challenges, food challenges, because these are challenges that have always plagued our cities. So the issues that I mentioned before, like accessibility, affordability, these are pertinent issues that have always been there with us. It's just that the issue of COVID has sort of elevated that and compounded the problem. And so food has never been a, seat, a top priority, but right now, based with the challenges that uh, COVID has brought uh, to the fore, then you'll find that cities are finding themselves in a position where they are now forced to feed their, their population. They're supposed to react and to provide emergency food. And in the absence of the national governments, then you find that cities are, they're, 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 they're basically crippled. And so the, those discussions, we've seen those discussions uh, uh, sort of uh, emerging again, and you can see that people are now starting to, to get into the, in, into the realization that we actually need to develop this food system and actually to, to bring in everyone on board so that we ensure that the food system is something that everyone within the city, even in the population, understands. So those discussions have already started uh, happening. And, and I think from all our channel, from all our discussions previously with the city, we've seen that there's some, some sort of bold mayoral leadership that is required because this, this inherently, these are sort of structural challenges and yet the solution is systemic. Is, is systemic. Yeah. So we need to find those system-based solutions to help them. And I think COVID has just uh, elevated that discussion up a, a little bit, uh, up a little bit as, as you have alluded to. Yeah. We've got a few questions coming in from our audience, but I just want to just ask one final question, which is you talked about solutions. So can you give me some ex any examples of some, some bright spots in Nairobi of, of some pioneering companies or something who are, who are sort of their, through their design or operations or their processing, whatever, are demonstrating sort of circular, regenerative, resilient food systems approaches? Yeah, I, I think that there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work that has been happening in Nairobi historically, and uh, and uh, there are very many organisations. We have uh, some of the organisations that are sort of multi-sectoral platforms. For example, we have one called the Nairobi and Environs uh, Food Safety, uh, Food Security and Agricultural Livestock Forum. It's it's sort of a, a platform uh, and a network initiative that has been run by Mazingira Institute for so many years, and this was actually even before before the before before the, the COVID crisis and before the city of Nairobi gained uh, its autonomy as a city government run government, that is in 2013. So they've been training hundreds of farmers. They've, you know, they're bringing, the farmers who bring produce into the city and uh, they've been focusing on youth and men, both, and both men and women in equal measure. And of course, collaborating with the city, which is very important. They've been collaborating with the city and using the city extension offices actually to sort of uh, work and train them in the larger metropolitan area. So these are farmers who are actually uh, uh, sourced of farmers who are actually working within the larger metropolitan area. So bringing in that element of that uh, urban rural linkages. We have other, we have other institutions like uh, non-governmental organizations, for example, we have uh, the Roads to Food Initiative, which has been advocating for human rights to food and of course also advocating for the food safety. And they've even petitioned parliament within the last six months to, for the withdrawal of harmful and carcinogenic pesticides that are still widely used here, despite being banned in other countries. So those are some of the issues, uh, some of the some of the uh, of the organisations, and also because they have also been working with producers, so making sure that the food that is comes to the city is actually safe, which is food safety is actually one of the pillars of the food strategy that is being developed by the city of Nairobi, 
We have a consumer grassroots association uh, group that has been actually working on consumer, uh, consumer education and also looking at sensitization of, and informing citizens so that they can actually make uh, and, and, and make the informed choices. We have youth organizations that are actually linking, linking uh, producers and consumers uh, online and making sure that, 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 that uh, they, they break some of these barriers that are brought about by Bindleman and so on. So basically, uh, in, that, in terms of Nairobi, that's it. But I also want, just wanted to mention one final thing, that in terms of an organ, from an organization perspective and globally, uh, C40 Cities as an, as an organization uh, launched the Good Food Cities Declaration. And this, this is, a, is a wonderful uh, uh, declaration. It's a, it, has, it has outlines bold ambitions. So, so far we have around 14 cities who have signed into the network, into the declaration. But if you look at the principles of the declaration, is basically what we are talking about in this forum. So you'll find that cities are actually taking charge and trying to align their food procurement policies to the planetary health diet. I'm sure you know about the planetary health diet that was launched and uh, launched uh, about one or two years ago. And then that's sourced and basing that, they're basing the the food sourcing actually on, on from organic agriculture, which which is great, trying to make sure that we uh, all our uh, all our all the, the the procurement that they control because cities definitely control a lot of procurement, mm. and, and those that have that then they should align those procurement policies to that, and of course just supporting also as another uh, tenant of the declaration is sort of supporting and increase uh, the increased consumption of healthy food, and and that's just just what. Uh, Harriet had just mentioned about this utopian economy where most people have been glorifying cheap food, which is not cheap at all. Mm. And of course, we're also talking about reduction of food losses in the declaration. So uh, from 2015 uh, figures, we're looking towards helping cities to sort of reduce their food and loss weight by 50%, which is massive. And for those cities which, which do not even have a baseline from where I operate and from where those cities which we are supporting right now, we are trying to also to help them and con uh, connect with partners to help them start developing those, uh, those, those, those baselines. Of course, and the biggest thing about uh, the declaration is just about collaboration and partnership. Yeah. So bringing all these businesses together, bringing all these uh, uh, public institutions together, just to make sure that they all have sort of a joint strategy and they join the bandwagon to help developing sort of sustainable food system strategies. So for me, I think that sort of en encapsulates what uh, moving forward in terms of uh, both at uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, an, at an at an organizational level, yeah. but also for all these small uh, different uh, organizations and institutions that are doing amazing work. Okay, um, a qu just a question from the uh, the audience. So you hinted at in your answer just now, but any conversation you have about African cities, the uh, the youth come up. I, I hear that uh, understand about something like half the population of Africa is below 18. <laughs> so any program that you have in a city needs to take into, you know, into account sort of youth employment. So how does the young, very demographics of, the, of Africa, how does that affect future visions of food systems? I think, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, you, you, you're right. Uh, the, 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 the population, the, the, the youth population is actually a dividend. Mm. to African cities. And, and, and I think moving forward, if you look at some of the challenges that uh, uh, some of actually some of the, the, some of the programs that actually cities are starting to, to put in place are actually targeted towards the youth and also young children. Because the, 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 the cities, cities are, are trying from, from a C40 perspective, for example, we're trying to look at, at food system from a, a dual approach. So it's not it's not, it's not from a reduction uh, perspective, mm. but uh, what uh, mostly people say, they, they call it from a, from a convergence point of view. So we are trying to also, to also avoid that nutrition transition. Remember you are an urbanizing, uh, and, and also an equally urban, highly urbanizing continent. So we do not want to have that nutrition transition towards unhealthy diets. And that's why you find that so, much, so many cities are actually implementing things like school feeding programs. And if you go to most of these cities, you'll find that mayors have a lot of uh, leverage, or cities have a lot of leverage on how do they work uh, on, on controlling procurement of, 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 uh, of the food that actually goes in, uh, it, it, that, that actually children uh, take. For example, if you look at even, uh, I'll give you an example of Johannesburg. Uh, 
just with COVID, over nine, about 9 million kids have already missed some of those nutritious uh, foods that they were taking before. So you, you realize that moving towards or putting more effort towards such, uh, such, uh, such initiatives, yeah. then it, it, it actually makes sure that we help shape uh, the, food, the food environment but also with, a, with an eye of sort of inculcating this culture of, of, good, of food that is actually good for people and is actually good for the planet. So how do, and, and just using the, the levers that we have, for example, or our, our mayors have to sort of uh, balance and get into that conversation and actually uh, guide, guide those, uh, those conversations and guide those, uh, and, and definitely avoid that nutrition transition. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. I'm afraid we've run out of time, um, but this has been a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate you joining us. If you want to know more about C40's work, then you can go to their website where they have a knowledge hub uh, open to cities and businesses. Uh, they also have a dedicated food system network section. Uh, so please uh, go and have a look at that. So we've come to the end of our first course. Uh, I don't know about you, but my appetite has been stimulated and I'm ready for more. But I'm afraid we're going to have to wait for tomorrow. Um, in fact, uh, our next session is at 5 p.m. UK time um, in the next course. But please be patient because we've got a real treat lined up for you. Four incredibly knowledgeable and innovative chefs from the US, from Europe, from South America and from Africa sharing with us how they've created positive impact through the way they select and prepare ingredients. And following that, we have two experts from the food service and hospitality sector to discuss how this maps out onto their industry. I hope you have time to appreciate a delicious meal in the meantime. We really look forward to welcoming you back tomorrow. And until then, from me and the rest of the team at the Big Food Workshop, goodbye. <laughs>